In the fall of 2016, the San Francisco 49ers quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, created a firestorm when he took a knee during the national anthem. He was protesting police brutality perpetrated against African-American men, and the reaction to his simple act of dissent was immense. Seemingly everyone, from our neighbors and coworkers to the tweet-happy president of the United States, had an opinion on the political stance of this single NFL football player. The following year, Kaepernick chose to become a free agent once it became clear that the 49ers were going to release him rather than let him play. Since that time, however, he has yet to play another game in the NFL. While this decision has never been directly tied to his protest, many believe that the quarterback's career has been ruined because of his political views. This is Caitlin Phillips with the Oxford Comment. On this episode, we examine the difficulties athletes face when they speak out on hot button subjects. Professional athletes can throw millions of dollars and their careers away if they go against ownership or create a backlash that stops fans from going to games, as seen in the Kaepernick incident. Student athletes have it even harder. Not only do they not have the resources or the economic safety net of professional athletes, they are beholden to the powers that be for their very livelihood, with little remittance. For the sake of transparency, both of today's interviews were recorded early in 2019, but they unfortunately remain crucially relevant to the world of sports and our culture as a whole. Our first guest is Trish Dalton, co-director and producer of the documentary, Student Athlete, which explores the exploitative world of college sports. Executive produced by LeBron James, the documentary aired on HBO in September 2018. We're here today with Trish Dalton. Trish, could you introduce yourself for us? Yes, hi. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker living here in New York City, and I just finished a feature-length documentary called Student Athlete about the exploitation of college athletes in America. Great. I um, just want to thank you again for joining us. Your documentaries have been used as a tool to enact social change. How do you think media, such as film, social platforms, can be used by athletes to push social justice movements forward? That's a good question. I feel like you see a lot more bigger athletes, like one of my executive producers, LeBron James, really using the platform of social media and the, the spotlight that goes on him to speak about a lot of human rights, social issues, specifically athletes' rights in terms of supporting this documentary. And I think you're seeing a lot more with Colin Kaepernick and with more athletes saying, listen, we have a following, we have a voice, and people are going to listen and support us. I think it's really interesting that you are putting this spotlight on student athletes because they sort of come up out of a broken system, right? They're sort of powerless and are coming up out of a system that says, shut up and dribble, right? But are in some ways, though, empowered because they're also told, you're the best, you're the greatest, you're, you know, coming up out of this. Do you see with some of the athletes that you interviewed, you know, the potential for using their voice? Do they sort of feel empowered in ways you know that you see that they can kind of break through and when they feel like they have a platform they can do more I feel like the reason that they're not speaking out is that they're afraid because Definitely. they have reason to be afraid they mm -hmm. have coaches and administration they from the NCAA and from the colleges telling them to shut up and dribble sensibly like mm -hmm. they are there to play and that the rules are the rules and, you know, if they speak out against them, then they'll lose their privileges. So for me, making this film, I just felt like, how can we as a society be okay with these guys having such strict rules on them? And you wouldn't do that in any other business or any other institution. Like if you told other college students, I'm sorry, but you can't say X, Y, or Z, I mean, they would be outraged. And yet these guys are, you know, basically told that, they, they, that you have to follow our rules. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've been on campuses and you've talked yeah. to these athletes. Do you see the potential for them to sort of break out of the shell once they have a platform? Well, what I, what I like how you framed your question is that you said, you know, in as a documentary filmmaker, as somebody who's done things on other human rights and why this topic was interesting to me is that I likened it to other movements where you have an oppressed group of people who do feel threatened to raise their voice. I mean, we just are coming out of Me Too. We've had players, particularly basketball players, who watched the film and had to walk out because they were so 
upset because they felt like our film was the first time they'd seen anybody talking about it. And I don't know uh, how other people have felt during the Me Too movement, but certainly it felt like all of a sudden you could talk about this more freely because before women were afraid. Mm-hmm. Because they would speak out and and there would be nothing would happen and they might potentially get more hurt. And I think it's a similar, you know, I think when you look at an oppressed group of people and why they're not talking because they feel afraid, I think that's the situation. I think what I hope and what I feel is possible is that we as a society can say, hey, we support these athletes. They should be having more rights. We want to live in a society where it's okay for athletes to have a voice <laughs> and and fair and just and we have a legal system that should be protecting that not defending the people who are enforcing the rules stopping them from talking and i think that we're hopefully at a time where i think as a society the more people and the more pro players who've now gone through the system like lebron like other big football and basketball players who are speaking up and saying this is not okay we disagree with the system it's not fair then they can feel supported because I think to date there's still been very few big players speak out in terms of on this topic but you've seen more and more and more and more coaches are saying you know what it's crazy that you know I'm making 10 million dollars and they're not allowed to get a free can of soda you know I think I think it's you know and so more and more they're saying that and I think that as that becomes part of the general understanding I think in in public in general public's understanding, I think then there'll be room for change, like we've seen in other movements. Did you get any like horror stories out of any of the students who did speak out, you know, who, or who did sort of take a stance on something? A lot of college players who have spoken out recently. I would name Nigel Hayes mm-hmm. and Josh Rosen as two of the biggest and most popular. And we actually spoke to their schools and asked if we could interview them because they were, for people who don't know about them, they were speaking out and saying, hey, this is a really messed up system and I should be getting paid and I do not have time to go to class. I do not have enough food. And they felt empowered to speak out and willing to risk the consequences. And their schools said, I'm sorry, but you're not allowed to talk to them and no press is allowed to talk to them. And I think that, you know, they took a really big risk in making two or three public statements, which is kind of crazy that they only made so little and yet made such a big splash of like, okay, these had a voice. And there was very little support to them. I mean, from the outside, from bigger players, people supported them, but there was still like the backlash in the press of like, oh, here's some players complaining, you know, like, I mean, that's the quick twist that, you know, the current quote unquote system it does to protect itself and, and, you know, continue the the word amateurism, continue the word student athlete, which they're not actually student athletes. They're, they're professional athletes, especially in the high revenue sports. But I think all players, if you're going and playing really intensely and you're practicing 40 or 50 hours a week, I mean, you're really at that school to play and there needs to be a bit more fair model for them. Right. And I think the thing that I always think about is and risk injury. You know, I mean, I think that that is, you know, what Robert Turner kind of brings in and talks about, you know, with CTE and, and really not understanding, you know, what the long term effects of football really are. So not only are you asking these kids to come and play at their best and not give them anything to fall back on, but you're also running the risk of, uh, you know, seriously injuring uh, some of these kids. and. Has that narrative, uh, you know, helped push forward the conversation a bit? I mean, just sort of reminding, you know, people that there's danger in this, especially in football. Yeah, I think that's a giant part of the conversation. Yeah. And we touch on it in our film in terms of some of the physical injuries that the, our players who are graduating had. And one of them, unable to walk if he continued to play, had back pain where he and to, he honestly didn't even talk about the extent of it on camera, but he couldn't move out of bed for five hours every morning because his back was in so much pain. And our other player had a dislocated shoulder that would keep going out, and he couldn't take Percocet. He would take Percocets every day if he could, he said, because the pain was so bad. But he didn't want to do that because of his liver or whatever else, other side effects of, of that. So he was just in chronic pain. Both of them had chronic pain. And I think the other side, I mean, you mentioned CTE, which I think is also a giant topic. I mean, one thing we realized within two months of filming, and we filmed for two years, was that this was a eight to ten part series because all of these topics deserved 
you know, a whole explanation and description. And when we decided to go with the just a one, one and a half hour film, we tried to keep it just to kind of touch on what these guys are up against and make it personal. But in terms of CTE, John and Marcia Shoup, who are in the film, they in particular did a lot of research and they actually hosted a forum where professors at Purdue, actually, where John was coaching at the time, were studying helmets that could actually protect from CTE and either brain injury. And they were prohibited from, like, basically that science was not being heard. And, and they were still wearing old helmets. And I think, like, when you hear things like that, okay, there there is technology out there. This this <laughs> The school is making millions of dollars. We're building a, what whatever, $1.5 million, whatever, stadium are we okay with spending a little bit more money so that the players have better helmets like that seems you know there's certain things knowing I mean you know we live in an age now where I think we're like every little kid wears a helmet now it's like I think their helmets could be better but there's um players who have left the NFL or left college sports and, and, and spoken out about it recently in the last couple of years Definitely. because they've said, okay, the uh, evidence, and, and I think that this should be widespread and they should, you know, it's like if you're going to go into a war zone, like tell me what, what the dangers are and what I should be ready for and what risks I'm going to take so that I can decide if I really won't feel like that's worth it. I feel like what is more talked about is you're the best, we're going to get you to the NBA or the NFL, even though they have this like whatever 1.5% chance, I think it's really still kind of being sold and they're told that. And so nobody, I don't think, from the players that I talked to, somebody said, oh, you, you might get hurt, so maybe you want to not play. Like I, that's not part of the conversation yeah, yeah. or how do how do you prevent that or what can you do instead right. you know it's a lot of just encouragement right yeah that's that seems to be a, a theme in robert's book he talks a lot about the players association uh, for nfl specifically they're not really given a lot of help and support and all this stuff and yet they're they're people with big platforms and so they can make a big deal out of issues they can be Colin Kaepernick you know they can uh, put a spotlight on something that desperately needs it do you think that sports and those kinds of um, those you know athletes and those kind of speakers have the platform to make real change or are they just sort of always going to be bogged down in this messy system do you think that they still have this opportunity to, to be a big voice I think kind of going going back to what I said earlier I feel like they do but right now they are there's fewer and they need more support and yeah. they need support from society they need people to second them to like their tweets to retweet their tweets yeah. whatever it is I think the reason again going back to other examples of like o- overthrowing oppression um, I mean and I think we touch on this in the film but a lot of the times these are this is a race topic this is right. a class Absolutely. topic and there's this is a situation where you have these underprivileged people that really this is their one chance that, that they are sold if you get this degree you're going to be out and that's just not the reality obviously anymore that you can, a degree will pave your way you know, it's like this piece of paper that they all still need other skills to understand how to use that degree. And I think that in the past with big successes in overthrowing was a matter of the society coming together. So in terms of in terms of can the athletes raise their voices, I feel like, yes, they can. And I feel like they need support from the more support that they have from us as the general public to say, yes, we support you. This is unfair and you deserve better. And I think let's just like we respect these young men and women and we support you. And right now they're not getting respect or support and it's heartbreaking. And I, I hope like our film put a light on that because, I mean, I'm still in touch with my guys and, you know, it's not better. It's worse right now. And they certainly don't have a voice or support. And I think it's one of those things that needs more light on it. And if and when players do speak out they really need us to support it and stand with them and I think it's like you know I keep going back to Colin Kaepernick but I I mean I think when players take that risk they really need the general public support and support to say you know we're here and we support you and you're right to do this because imagine how much backlash they are risking and getting 
never mind like career opportunities and everything. I mean, the thing is, if current player who is coming out of poverty is this is his quote unquote ticket, if he or she speaks out, they're really risking losing that. And I've heard horror stories from. Like I said, it's not just the highest revenue sports, but I mean a lot of women's sports and things where they're still bringing attention and their sports are still a part of the school's reputation. They're still bringing a lot of school identity. And I feel like that's a lot of pressure on them and to to win and to play. And it's not a fair system. And they're not, it, it should be that they should be allowed to use their likeness and to benefit from that. There, there, there shouldn't be any, you know, rig up on that. They should be able to go to the NFL or the NBA without having to go through college. Uh, they should be able to just have representation. And and I'm hopeful that the rules, part of it is that the, the, the law needs to support them and, and, and hopefully can help make some change as well. But I do think, like, if you look at the history of these things, I mean, it takes public opinion to push change so everybody i hope everyone supports them (laughs) well i think that's a really good part to end on you know of be supportive i mean like you said it can be as simple as retweet some things or you know do some research watch some documentaries you know do your own research and, and figure out what these students are actually asking for they're not being stubborn brats or they're not you know demanding too much i think that they're asking for some really simple basic um, rights and, yeah, yeah uh, so. just basic basic respect and i think if there are students that are brave enough and players and athletes who are brave enough to speak out at any level i think supporting that and i think social media is a powerful platform and and that that is our tool right now where that can reach such a broad audience and hopefully that can help to push the laws to push change. All right. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Our second guest is Robert Turner, Assistant Professor of Clinical Research and Leadership at George Washington University and author of Not For Long, The Life and Career of the NFL Athlete. The interview touches on a wide range of topics, from a comparison between the NBA and NFL's reactions to activism amongst their players, to how a player's longevity can play into his or her political activism. Robert, could you introduce yourself for us? Sure. Uh, As you mentioned, I'm I'm Robert Turner. I'm an assistant professor at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and I'm in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership. Excellent. Thank you so much for being with us today. So I'm going to start us off with a question here. In your personal experience, what kind of pressures do athletes face when voicing their opinion, when it can be on the more political side or at least a little bit on the complicated side? Well, I think that question is really kind of interesting based on what level of athlete you're talking about. As you know, as the author of um, Not For Long in the Life and the Career of the NFL Athlete, what I really focus on is looking at athletes across the whole life course. But of course, the the most important part that I focus on is life in the NFL and when people transition to life after the NFL. And I think, you know, if we, if we just talk about on the political spectrum, obviously one of the big things that people look to most recently recently, or, or, you know, like Colin Kaepernick when he took a, a knee and then the president decided to call the NFL athletes bums, throw them out of the country. Actually, he called them SOBs, right, and suggested that they were unpatriotic. So, you know, there's pressures on that level, and that that's when it reaches the kind of the highest level. But then there's also pressures about... Um, I would say being good citizens, and many of them about being in the spotlight in one moment, but then the more mundane things about making sure that they're good husbands and good fathers and brothers and those kinds of things. And then also the fact that they're very young, they make lots of mistakes, some of them really bad mistakes, and then other ones are kind of minor things. But when you're in the spotlight, it's amplified. Whatever you do it has a potential to be on the news at any moment in any day. Yeah, I, I find it really fascinating that pro athletes speak out after sort of seeing how much college athletes are tamped down. I find it really interesting that some of these athletes were able to break out and say, you know, I have some important things to say and I I have some insight into things. You know, what do you think it is about some of those athletes that can break the mold and be outspoken and not sort of have that fear and not have that sort of taken out of them? 
Well, generally what I would say is it depends on what league you're looking at, especially if we're talking about on the pro level, right? One of the big differences between the National Football League and the National Basketball Association is when Commissioner Adam Silver came out early, and he's been in the league about five years now, but he came out quite early and made a public statement that, listen, in the the way that professional basketball, in order for it to thrive and survive, is we have to look at it as a partnership between the players, the owners, and the league office. And we need to work together for, you know, success of the league. And one of the things that I think is really interesting, if you remember, oh, maybe this was a year or two ago, there was a serious situation in Sacramento where there was protest, particularly from Black Lives Matters and others, where they felt that the police had unjustly uh, targeted is a black man and shot him in the in the back, particularly in his grandmother's backyard. And so people went out in front of the basketball stadium and they rallied and they basically protested and it shut the game down one night and, and um, the next night it, you know, slowed the game down. And so the owner of the Sacramento Kings came out and made a statement with the basketball players and said, hey, we all live in this community. We are all committed to justice, and we all want to make sure that anything that happens in our community that affects one of us, it affects all of us, not just black athletes or anybody, but we stand shoulder to shoulder to find ways to get justice in the community. And if you think about that and you juxtapose that against the way that the NFL looks at things, Jerry Jones, the owner of the Cowboys, made a statement that if you're going to play for the Cowboys, you will not take a knee. You will stand. You will do what I tell you to do, or you won't be a member of the Dallas Cowboys. And so the way that the NFL looks at it is they look at it in such a way you hear athletes sometimes mentioning they feel like like they're slaves on a plantation. Or in other words, you work for me, boy, you do what I tell you to do. I own the league, and all you do is collect a paycheck and you go home. So it's two very different ways of looking at and appreciating the men who work for you or work with you alongside you and responsible for some of the success of the league that you're in. What do you think it is about the basketball league that is so different? I know that you have mentioned before the Players Association should be stepping up and doing more for football players. Is there a stronger Players Association within basketball? Or is it just that it happens to have, you know, more benevolent leaders? Well, maybe they do have more benevolent leaders. Maybe they don't. I can't really say. I, I, that would be beyond the scope mm-hmm. of what I do know, especially for the research that I did for the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you know, I spoke with 140 NFL athletes, former, current college players and all that. Uh, and and I, in the NBA, I, I don't really want to venture too far into that because it's a different sure, sure. world. But I will say that one of the things that is really different is that Athletes, when they're playing basketball, you know, you see them, you see their face, you see who they are. Football players are hidden behind masks. You know, they have their equipment. You're, you know, removed away from them on the field. So there's a a great deal of more uh, agency, I guess you could say, and basketball players. The league allows the basketball players to have their own identities come out into the public much more than, say, football players. But I do see that in terms of the way that, the owners or management approaches the players are quite different. And, I, I, you know, from the work that I did with the book and, and, you know, doing a lot of archival research with data, what I really have come to the conclusion is that, um, and others have said this, that NFL players have made some real strides when it comes to labor over the year, their labor agreement. But when it comes to having any kind of influence on how the league is run, uh, their health issues, those kinds of things, it's been very hands-off. It's been very contentious with the owners there. I'm not sure why that is, but in part, the money is really, really big in the NFL, as we know. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Seeing those contracts out sometimes is just uh, nuts. Um, and then sort of extrapolating from that, that the owners are making so much more than even any individual player um, is, is definitely a, an interesting, you know, thought process. So let me ask you this, though. Do you think that as players speak out, it'll become easier to speak out? Do you see a trend towards that opening up a little bit more as public opinion has 
swung to the other way and said, we want to hear some of these voices a little bit more than it ever has in the past? Well, again, I think that that depends on the league, depends on the level. We're talking, as we, mm-hmm. we you mentioned earlier, in college, we don't see that. I think one of the big things that is quite different today than it has been in generations before is, obviously, we have new media. We have Twitter. We have all different ways for individuals to reach out. But I think it's very curious that in the NFL in particular, in that situation, we saw amongst color lines, regional lines in the country, class lines, people, I mean, just take a look at the Kaepernick situation again when Nike came out and said that that Just Do It campaign where they use Kaepernick's face, right? That was so polarizing and so divisive in this country. People along the South were really, really upset with Nike for that. People went out initially and were burning their uh, shoes and stuff, and they were telling athletes, and we saw the same situation on television. I can't remember the news anchor's name, but what she told basically LeBron is just to shut up and dribble, right? So I think when we saw particularly Northeasterners, and then we saw uh, people out in California, West Coast, they were appalled by the president and others telling athletes to just shut up and to play, uh, taking away their kind of civil rights and don't think that they have any, any right to make statements about you know, what they see America is, and people were calling them unpatriotics. But then in other parts uh, of the country, we, we felt that players were, again, really viewed as, you're here to entertain us. You ought to be lucky. You're getting paid a lot of money to play, and I wish, you know, quote, unquote, my boss would give me millions of dollars. I'd shut up in a minute. Well, so I think that in some respects, sports is just like, you know, it's kind of divided the way politics is in our country and some issues, and particularly you can't take uh, race out of the equation when you're looking at these black men who supposedly are making lots of money and they're standing up and saying that there are injustices that we can't live with. And people are saying, you should be happy that you paid that much money. What are you complaining about? I think that's why I find some of this so captivating because it's such a struggle to be an athlete, you know, to stay in the league. The statistic about NFL players only having 3.3 seasons in their career is just a staggering statistic for me because it's such a short amount of time to get what you can out of it. And it's their opportunity to do that. You know, it's it's your money-making opportunity. But then they also choose to speak out about issues that are important to all of us and jeopardize that a bit. You know, I just find that really fascinating and important. I mean, they have this big platform, right? They, they have millions of followers. They have the ear of publicists and journalists and everything. Do you think it's important for these athletes to step up and speak up, even though it, it can be kind of dangerous for them? Well, I think what we have to do is we have to put it in a larger context. One of the things is really important in the book, I have a chapter, and it's it's about power and control in the black body. And I talk about how the athletes themselves experience and see race, particularly about black athletes. And it, and it comes down across a couple of different lines. Um, there's a, a really important comment in the book that one of the athletes makes, uh, Abdul. He says, basically, listen, there are some athletes that say where they see a racial issue, they feel like it is their duty as a black person to speak up against any injustice, whether it's in the league or out of the league. There are others that have learned, you know, assimilation. They don't really experience race. They believe that these are individual instances of race. But all in all, there's a lot of good people, and there's a a great deal to be learned about assimilating into the culture of the league, and everybody wins, right? Well, you know, those are two uh, very different ways of experiencing race and seeing race in, in the league. But at the same time, we got to understand these are very young people. You start and you enter in the league at, you know, some one of the youngest guys that I interviewed was 20 years old, but most enter around 22, 23 years old. And the average career is 3.3 season. We know people like Tom Brady play a long time, right? But These men that are making these decisions, whether they want to speak out or whether they don't want to speak out, whether they feel like they're going to jeopardize something or not jeopardize something, they have to recognize that many of them have families at home. They've got to figure out 
how do they feed their children. They're representing their communities that they came from. All of these things weigh into who's willing to speak out and who's not willing to speak out. Uh, Malcolm Jenkins, who is on the Philadelphia Eagles, Malcolm Jenkins speaks out forcefully about communities need to change and about social justice. He's framed it in a social justice area. We need to speak out. Athletes are speaking about it. injustices, whether it's black, white, gender, anything. Wherever we see injustice, we have a responsibility to speak out. So I think that that's another thing that's so interesting about this is, again, the black and white dynamics that are inside the sports, outside of the sports, and who has the agency to choose to be silent and who feels that they do not have the ability to be silent because they have to speak about it. Yeah, I mean, I think you pull up a really good point of allyship, right, is that the burden can't be on the oppressed. It needs to come from outside. You have to recognize when things are going on around you. And and I think Chris Long is a a great example. Um, He just won the... Yeah, Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for the NFL. Yeah, exactly, Um, which was lovely and and I think well-deserved. And I hope that other athletes kind of look to him as an example, you know, and, and talk to their teammates and see, you know, what their issues are, you know, where they're coming from, what their background is, and what the things that they care about are. Do you think that the public is shifting in any way? Do you see backlash softening in ways? Um, Do you think that we're getting to a point where we kind of lifted the veil a little bit and say, oh, okay, you know, these are are men with, you know, really great ideas and and this isn't just go play your your sport and, you know, you're just an athlete, but actually, oh, uh, these are humans with really good ideas and and really interesting backgrounds. And, you know, do you see a a public shift in any way? I see, again, that it's situational, right? I feel as though where the president whipped the public into this frenzy and you heard all of these negative comments about athletes, but then there are other situations where people say, well, wait a minute, these guys are part of our community. I think people were quite offended, and I think they should have been. We even saw the president's wife when they came out against LeBron and said, shut up and dribble, and the president kind of even weighed in, and, and, and the president's wife said, wait a minute, did you see all the great things this man has done for a long time? extended period of time for his own community and other communities around him. LeBron himself had said he came from an impoverished neighborhood that was basically surrounded by all black people and he did not know about white people, was a little afraid of white people, didn't like white people. He said, but basketball opened that and bridged the whole gap for him that helped him understand that there are people who are not like him, but they really, they're not threats or anything else like that. And look at all the wonderful things that he's done. And and people have expressed uh, how grateful they are that here's a man who is really committed to making this a better country. So I think, you know, the the jury is still out about how people see athletes and what athletes say. I believe that there are some definite boundaries, but I do think that athletes are now starting to recognize that they have a responsibility and they're not going to remain silent and they are going to contribute and speak out where they feel like they need to. But there is always this cost because at the end of the day, they are working for people, for someone else, and how the people they work for decide to respond to their civic or public engagement is always going to put them at risk if the owners feel like they've stepped across the boundary too far. You know, how this all kind of started was I played football professionally, and I played in college. I got a scholarship, and so, you know, I've had my opportunity out there to see it, and I knew what that experience was like for me, but I also knew kind of as we were alluding to is that oftentimes when I was in the media or other athletes were in the media, we felt this kind of real distrust because often what you were being said was somehow or another being twisted or turned or misrepresented when it found its way into the newspaper. And so one of the tasks that I wanted to do was go out and ask athletes and try to capture their own experiences. But what became very immediate for me was the challenge of how has life changed since I played in the 80s, right? What has shifted? What has changed both on the, I guess, the youth sports level, the high school level, the college level, and the pros? And what we have today is what I really emphasize in the book is that, you know, we really have intensely this uh, sports industrial complex where sports is such an important contributor to the culture of our country, and it generates 
gobs of money. Even youth sports is a multi-billion dollar industry now. And so I shine light in the book about how we have professionalized youth sports to the point that we expect our young kids to be on television, to to be celebrities, to somehow or another act and behave and train like professional athletes. So imagine the pressure that they're under and imagine what happens when everything is escalated and they have to transition out of the sport if they've never actually made it to the big leagues like someone has anointed to them every day of their young lives. And I just point out real quickly in the news, Jim Harbaugh, the coach of the Michigan Wolverines, who makes $7 million himself, he just offered a young man who's in the seventh grade a scholarship to be the quarterback of Michigan, who he's not even going to be eligible to enter into that school for over 10 years. Imagine the pressure that puts on that little kid, as well as Think about the hundreds of thousands of other kids who are dreaming of someday being the quarterback at Michigan and wondering in the seventh grade, well, what about me? What does that say about my athletic ability? What do I have to do to get that kind of scholarship? That's an immense amount of pressure that kids go under today that, you know, fortunately I did not have to experience years ago. Right, yeah, and then add on the any other social pressures that they're feeling at that point, you know, whether from their community or family. I mean, it, it just... I can't imagine, you know, what that sort of felt like to have that spotlight so young. Yeah, it is. Uh, I will tell you again. In my day, when I was playing, it was it was quite different. We did have those pressures, but just as you mentioned, it was nowhere national. It was I never heard about a guy being in seventh grade getting a scholarship. That was today. It made ESPN news. <laughs> so the parents are also thinking about well. My kid deserves that kind of uh, accolades and notoriety as well. And then there's another thing that is so vastly different today that has kind of amped up sports across America for families, and that is the cost of the college education. You know, I think when I went to James Madison University, my mom, she laughs at me now. She says, when I signed my scholarship – the whole scholarship in the four years, I think it cost like $16,000, $17,000, $18,000 James Madison University in the early 80s, and that was across four years. Today, a scholarship can be worth over $100,000. And think about families saying, I got two or three kids. There's no way that I can afford to send my kids to college. Scholarships are the way to go. So there's that much more pressure on top of you know just the media pressure of wanting to live up to an expectation to be the next LeBron James or Tom Brady and you're in the seventh grade. Right. It's amazing how it's all knotted together. Absolutely. And that, those are really the essence of the things that I tried to capture because, again, I was speaking to former athletes. I was speaking to athletes that were in um, the NFL at the moment. I was speaking to college athletes, trying to get a complete picture of helping me understand why do athletes have a difficult time in their transition into life after football? What does it mean to be an athlete? What does it mean to be on this long-term apprenticeship in in football? In particular, you start playing around junior high school and you don't make it until you're in your 20s and then think about it. All of a sudden, what I really talk about in the book is this involuntary role exit. You know, for me in my life, I spent 12 years getting myself prepared to audition to play professional football. Then I played for four years, and then all of a sudden, the dream was done. It was over. I was forced out of what it was that I loved to do. And so this was somewhat of a crisis in my life, and I think that people who even aren't sports fans can connect with the question of when something happens that's unexpected, the roof caves in, your whole world around you that you have known kind of crumbles, how do you pick yourself back up, and how do you move on, right? And that's one of the things that NFL athletes, former athletes, can kind of tell us. Some have done it better than others, but the fact is is that now all of a sudden you you find yourself asking yourself, who am I without that sport? My kids are out of the house. I'm an empty nester now. What do I do now? How do I now go and live life for myself? That's one of the things that we do see from some of the athletes, some who have done it successfully, some who have struggled, but ultimately you're forced to figure out what is my next step after this has happened that I didn't expect it to be this way. 
Yeah, I, I just think that's really fascinating and interesting work. Well, this has been a really fascinating conversation, Robert. I wish we could talk all day, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so do I, I wish as well. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, and have a good rest of your day. We want to thank our featured guests, Trish Dalton, director of Student Athlete, and Robert Turner, author of Not For Long, for joining us on this episode of The Oxford Comment. As always, we would like to thank the crew of The Oxford Comment for their continued assistance on each episode. Be sure to follow The Oxford Comment on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to The Oxford Comment on Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. I'm Caitlin Phillips. Thank you for listening.